It's so nice to be with you all today. And thanks so much for this kind invitation. Um, I love to share information about um, the beautiful plant materials that we have around us that can be used in floral design. And, you know, truly what better time of year to create floral design and have a good excuse for it than this time of the year. And uh, today is a great day for us to be together because now that the Thanksgiving leftovers are, you know, sort of becoming passe. We're turning our attention now to making that transition in floral design from fall decorations to Christmas time. You know, here um, in the Mississippi Gulf Coast, I've seen so many people putting their Christmas trees up early and I say, great. Um, this is a great time for us to uh, have the excuse to bring a little bit of joy into our home. <clears throat> so no criticism about anyone decorating early this year. Don't do it. Uh, join in that fun and create more fun in your house. Uh, as Dr. Keeney mentioned to you, um, I work in extension specifically in floral design and floriculture here at the MSU Coastal R&E Center in Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, I, people ask me a lot of times, where do you live? And I tell them I live on I-10. Uh, pretty much in the corridor between uh, New Orleans to Biloxi Ocean Springs, traveling um, in, in that particular vicinity. So, so many of you um, understand what I'm talking about when I talk about some of the different plant materials that you're going to see later on in the program. But before I get into that, I want to share with you a couple of other, um, call it visual aids, if you will, um, to give you an idea of the type of work that we do here at MSU Coastal. Uh, besides teaching and leading the statewide master floral designer program here in Mississippi, um, I also have floral enthusiast classes. And with the pandemic, we've had a little bit of a challenge getting this through because we really can't create uh, floral designs that are easily uh, created via social distance because my floral design studio here in Biloxi normally uh, accommodates about eight people at a time. So if we socially distance, that's four people. So it's pretty difficult to do that. So one of the things that we did was we shipped plant materials to our learners. And the pandemic has forced so many of us, and I know all of you um, are part of this too, into doing things a little bit differently. And we're glad that maybe, you know, we've learned how to do this, though we can't wait to get back to normal. So I want to share with you this first little floral design. This is an arrangement that was part of our um, fall fresh floral uh, design course. And the participants in the class learned how to make this arrangement. This design was created to use on a buffet table. So it uses um, some large, some of the large uh, uh, African marigolds, which could easily be grown, you know, around us. Although these were commercially produced in California. Um, some little Veronica here in that pretty ballpoint pen ink color, like a big pen ink color. And then getting around um, on the other side of the design, it's, it's a foam arrangement, so it's made in a tray. Um, a, a nice foliage, we don't really grow this one here so much. This is a California foliage, it's called Myrtle, but we do have similar greens. Very fragrant when it's cut and crushed. And then I've got some um, little Sweet William here on this side, the Dianthus, which grows beautifully um, in our high tunnels in Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. You know, floriculture production from our states is increasing slowly but surely. And that's great because there's nothing like the freshness of a locally grown cut flower. So when you have the opportunity, do purchase um, local, locally grown cut flowers from those producers who are near and dear to you. A lot of times you'll meet them um, at your local market. But the idea behind this design was to create a miniature garden for the tabletop. And our participants learned how to do that and I think they had fun. Also, I wanted to share with you this design that's behind me. You know, talking about the Christmas season, the fall and Christmas season, this is a um, wreath that is made on a grapevine wreath form. Now, I don't buy my grapevine wreath forms, I make them. So around uh, the time of January or February, when all of the muscadines 
um, are dormant and being cut back to prepare for uh, their flush of foliage in the spring, it's a great time to get with those uh, great producers because they have a lot of these vines that are extra and they're so happy when you take them away because all they usually do is just haul them away and or burn them. So I form my own wreaths by hand. I found I can create about eight wreaths per hour is about the quickest I can go once I get my rhythm together. Uh, but then we just had a variety of dried flowers that were used in this design. So I've got uh, sunflowers here, uh, some hydrangea paniculata, limelight or similar, some dried celosia, some yarrow. Um, this is uh, status tataricum, German status. These materials were purchased in from a uh, grower in Oregon. And this particular grower specializes in dried flowers and they use heat to dry their flowers. Very simply, they uh, collect their dried flowers, hang them up in a barn, put heaters in the barn to raise the temperature within the barn to about 100, 110 degrees. And that um, low temperature heat quickly dries the flowers and helps them to retain the color. But believe it or not, this wreath is about a year old. So what I did as the hydrangeas maybe sort of lose a little bit of color, I used some floristry tricks um, by misting them down with some of our um, flowers, or rather uh, some of our color tools that we use in professional floristry. So I talk a lot about these different things because my program is all the way across the board. I work with consumers in the Master Floral Designer Program and Floral Enthusiast Program. I also work with professional florists who want to learn time-saving tips and techniques. In 2021, we plan to roll out a professional florist training program, and I also work with flower farmers throughout the state, mostly in the marketing end, so that they understand how their flowers can be used and what the consumers, whether they're retail florists or consumers like you and I picking up flowers at the farmer's market want. So having all of that, um, I want to um, share with you a little bit of information now to um, create or get the idea of creating your own floral design. I like to go through this slowly and show you all the steps of how to do this step by step. And the wonderful Haley Judge from LSU Ag Center, the Burden Center, has helped me to coordinate this program. And uh, I'm sure she has already shared information with you about um, the corresponding handouts that go with this program. I want you to know that when we create handouts like this, we take them quite seriously. We want to make sure that you have all of the information that you um, need in order to put it together. So it is an extension publication that goes through peer review with two different people, um, usually someone from outside of our institution who takes a look at them and gives us um, some really great feedback and then we print these or we put them online and we make them available to everyone. And that's a, another reason why I think it's so nice to be working with LSU Ag Center because we think of so many of our um, you know, institutions of higher uh, learning as being very much within the state. When you think of LSU, you think of purple and gold and football. And when you think of Mississippi State University, you think of maroon and white and football. Now, I don't know a thing about football, and frankly, I really don't care about it. What I care about is teaching people about floral design and floriculture. So that being said, I'd like to welcome you to um, learning a little bit more about these topics. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a swag, S-W-A-G. That word has kind of changed over the past several years, you know, kind of referring to swag and swagger, maybe, you know, uh, meaning someone who maybe has a little bit of a, a cool attitude. But we're going to create a floral design that is a classical geometric form using this floral design mechanic. This is fresh flower foam that has been encased in a two piece cage. You can find these at your local flower shop. You can also purchase them online. Uh, you know, if you're looking for floral supplies today, you just Google it and you can find these oftentimes uh, maybe one or two at a time all the way up to a case. But if you're working in terms of like decorating a church 
or some people like our master gardeners, master floral designers, work in decorating historic homes and historic buildings. So they need more than one of these. So it's possible now to do this sort of thing quite easily. Um, I want to show you what I've got here um, and, and kind of tell you a little bit about the mechanic. Now, like I said, the mechanic is made with a block of fresh flower foam in a two-piece cage. But when I'm working on a floral design that's going to hang on a door, I never really trust it to hold together. So many of these cages have been made uh, for event design, weddings, parties, <clears throat> this sort of thing. But when you're creating a floral arrangement that's going to be hanging on your door, you want to make sure that it's going to be held in place um, when the door is open and closed multiple times. Or if you live in Louisiana, Mississippi, like we do, you have to make sure that it can survive tornadoes and hurricanes and everything that the week will bring you. My goodness, the cleanups that we still have um, in my neck of the woods from Zeta. So that being said, um, I'm using some waterproof tape. And this is a floral design mechanic um, that is used commonly uh, to tape fresh flower foam in place within a container. And you can see I'm creating kind of like a secondary cage, if you will, going around the original cage uh, just to make sure that these two pieces don't pop off. I feel like that's good and secure, so I'm going to go on from there. Now, my next uh, step in creating the arrangement is to use what we refer to as the free float method of designing with flowers, free float method of hydrating the fresh flower foam. What that means is you should fill um, a container such as a dish pan, or it could be a kitchen sink, with water. Now, if you're arranging evergreens like I am, there's no need to add fresh flower food to this water to create a fresh flower food solution. If you have it, you can. And professional florists, it's recommended that you do that so that you hydrate your floral foams with fresh flower food. But when you're working with evergreens from the yard and garden, they're tough. Now, as I'm going there, I'm going to tell you this right from the beginning. If you make this design and you put it on your door in Louisiana or in Mississippi now, it's going to be dead in one to two weeks. Reason being, we're working with live evergreens and our you know, December can be very warm. And oftentimes when we have workshops like this, one of the main questions I get from people is, how long will this last, number one, and you know, if you put it on your front door and the uh, sunset is beating down on it, you can expect this to last about a week. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of times in my workshops, we won't make one, we'll make two. And I'll tell my students in the workshop, make one now and put it on your door for the first two weeks of December. But in the refrigerator, and it's not probably the refrigerator that's in your kitchen, it's the one in your garage that holds all the beer. So we got to move all those cans of beers over. We put this uh, swag in a perforated trash bag. So a, a plastic bag that has lots of holes poked in it for air circulation and put it right in the refrigerator. That's what the pros do. They have a humid refrigerator for storing these type of designs and they last in refrigeration for weeks or months. Then, as it gets closer to Christmas time, you can always take the fresh one out and pop it into place and everything is refreshed. So that, that's a nice way of doing it. Now, the second big question I get from people is, is there anything you can spray on that to make it last longer? And the answer is a resounding no. Now, let me talk to you a little bit about that. If you go to a Christmas tree lot or a nursery to buy a cut tree right now, you might notice that there was a little bit of dye added to the tree. In addition to that, it could also be a layer of what is referred to as an anti-transparent spray, anti-transpiring, anti-transparent spray, which means it's a stomate sealer. Those stomates that are on the leaves get sealed with a layer of liquid plastic. Now, it will seal moisture within those leaves or the needles or broad leaves or needle type evergreens, but it makes a difference in your cut greens 
in a swag lasting maybe another few hours or a day. Anti-transparent sprays that are used in floristry help a floral design to last a few hours longer, not days and certainly not weeks. So there really aren't real magic bullets to this type of thing. Um, I know this um, uh, from science and I know this from my experience. Um, I used to um, uh, do all of the uh, floral decorations for an antebellum home in Columbus, Mississippi when I was on faculty on our main campus. And uh, one of the things that I did was I tried one year to use future floor wax which becomes an anti-transparent spray because it dries clear. But if you use um, you know, these evergreens on a mantle, they'll be shiny, but they will be brittle because they'll, they're going to dry and die anyway. It just goes back to the way that Christmas was celebrated towards the third quarter of the 19th century into the 20th century. But Christmas decorations in 1880 went up on December 23rd, 24th. Today, we decorate for Christmas on November 23rd or 24th. So that's why those artificial materials are so popular. But, you know, as hort uh, uh, horticulturist to horticulturist, seems like the older I get, the less I want of the artificial stuff and the more I want just a few tasteful, fresh designs. And that's what we're talking about today. So my bin is filled with water. I'm going to use the free float method, which means I drop that mechanic upside down into this vat of water. Um, it will drink up the water at its own rate of speed. You never want to push fresh flower foam below the water line because you, if you do, you can create what is called dry core. Dry core means there is an area within that brick of foam that never got fully soaked. So as you make your floral placements into the foam, you think that those cut ends are touching um, the wet foam and taking up water when indeed they're hitting dry foam and then they won't last as long. That's especially true if you're working with delicate fl cut flowers. You see, there is so much to learn when you create a fresh floral arrangement. That's why um, floral design is best learned in a structured learning environment. And we would love um, to share more of that with you. So in about the minute that it took um, for me to explain that, this brick of foam is fully hydrated. And you can see some water drips out. As I make placements into the floral foam, it will, um, more water will be displaced from that foam. So. That's why we want to make sure that when we design with flowers, we have kind of a wet lab environment. You want to do this in your kitchen, maybe in a, in a shed, or I think the best place is a floral design studio where you can really trash the place and have fun and then clean up afterward. Okay, so that being said, I um, kind of want to move here to um, the next fun part of this and to explain a little bit more about what I want to do. This arrangement um, needs to be decorative, not only on the front, but importantly, when you're making a wall or door decoration, you need to bring that plant material all the way to the back of the mechanic. Otherwise, when the door is partially open, we'll see this non-decorative mechanic. And that is, um, that is you know, not good um, because it's, it's not natural. It kind of takes away from the overall effect. So I've harvested some different plant materials from <clears throat> the South Branch Experiment Station for Mississippi State, uh, located uh, up in Poplarville, which is about an hour north of here. Um, I travel to Poplarville about once a week uh, to work on some of our experiments that we have up there. And we have a really nice selection of different types of foliage. Um, plus, um, my cut flower starts are up there that I bring back to my high tunnel and grow on and that we use in floral design um, in, our, in our programming. So I've got a nice little selection of things. I'm going to pull them and talk to you about them as I roll. Uh, this is called um, Sweet Anise. This is the plant material that um, is a nice broadleaf evergreen. And when the leaves are crushed, it has a very nice spicy anise scent. Once in a while, you'll come across the little um, pod and you can see one right there. That's where we get uh, the, um, the spice from. So that's kind of a nice little thing. Sometimes, you know, if you um, get into flowers to wear, that's a nice little item to put on your lapel 
for the holiday, a little pin on there, and uh, you have that wonderful fragrance. The order of placement to work with plant materials is to place line, then mass, then filler. Line, then mass, then filler. What do I mean by that? Well, this foliage in an arrangement is more linear than some of the others that I'll be working with. So I wanna put this into my design first. The line materials are like a skeleton in floral design. They establish, uh, they establish what the overall geometry is going to be. The mass materials go in second. They provide the muscle and then filler materials that are frilly help to bridge the gaps between those two very different forms in floral design. So I, I could take this now, and you saw me just break that large branch apart. I could impale it into the foam, but not ready yet. There's more that we can do to this, and I want to share this with you. This is one of the um, many tips that I share in my floral design classes with folks, and I call them million dollar tips because they save a lot of headache. You know, once you make an arrangement and it looks good, you want to display it and go on to the other things that you're doing, especially when you're creating floral designs for holidays. There are other things to do, wrapping presents, making cookies. I love those sour cream cookies or those peanut blossoms with the chocolate. Oh, so, so good. Um, but, you know, the other things to do. So what are we going to do? I'm going to show you. One is we call this the Mississippi State University screwdriver cut. Now, I work with a knife because a knife is relatively quick to use. It becomes the sixth finger of my right hand, and um, it makes a nice clean cut, particularly when you're working with soft herbaceous stems like cut flowers. Now, with woody materials, it's okay to go through and to use, you know, snips, little garden snips, or your, um, you know, um, uh, branch cutters, whatever um, type of heavy duty plant material for woody materials. But with a knife, um, once uh, you learn how to do this properly, it becomes very, um, very nice and um, quick for your designing. Now, you may have noticed when I cut this stem, I sliced it on one side, I turned it over and I sliced it on the other. So it becomes like a flat head screwdriver. Once you wedge that into fresh flower foam, your stem, your branch will stay put. A lot of people who are master gardeners, master floral designers, will create larger arrangements, um, let's say for um, social events, exhibitions, church. You may have like a real large stem, a plant material that you want to use at a diagonal, and you put it in your design and then what happens? It flops over. If you use the MSU screwdriver cut, flat and flat, it'll stay put. Very simple. Now, another thing that I like to do, and this is another million dollar tip, is to use a wired wood pick. When you purchase these, you'll buy a, a little bundle of them. You could give half of them away to your best flower arranging friend and keep half of them and you'll still have enough for a lifetime. When I apply these two items together, um, it, it's a really wonderful marriage because it's gonna to help to keep this stem in place. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. So I take my fresh flower stem or my stem of the anise or anise, and then I uh, align it in a parallel fashion to the wood pick. Then I wrap the wire around the top of the um, uh, stem of anise so the wire makes a spiral only around the, the fresh stem. Then the second spiral goes around the fresh stem and the uh, wood pick, and you spiral it all the way down like this. Then to keep this really sturdy, I'm going to take some uh, tape. This can be scotch tape at home. This could be waterproof tape, the one that I just showed you to secure the mechanic, or it could be stem wrap that's used for corsage and boutonniere work. If you'll notice though, that little cut end of the stem and, uh, and the tape, uh, the tape does not really cover up that cut end of the stem. So that fresh tissue is exposed so that it can drink up water. Then the next thing I'm going to do is I'll take my pruning shears and I cut that um, a wooden pick so it's just a little bit longer than the fresh stem. 
And then I'm ready to make that first placement. And I'll show you what, I, what I've done. When I place that, uh, uh, when I place the anise into the foam, it is impaled into that fresh flower foam for a distance of about two inches. Why? Because when this goes on the door, there's going to be a lot of swinging that's going on. There's going to be um, moisture loss in the foam, moisture loss in the plant material. I want it to stay put as long as possible because I really don't, once I make it, I really don't want to have to deal with it too much. So that screwdriver cut along with the reinforcement of the wood pick is a great way to learn how to uh, or to make sure that your flower stems stay put. Um, and a lot of times it's, it's the kind of thing that you really don't know on your own. It's just one of those tips for anchoring that's so important. Now that I've made uh, that first placement, I'm going to make another one on the opposite side of the um, placement number one with some more of the anise. But I'm going to remove some of the side branches from this one and I'm going to place it into the, into the design uh, so that uh, it creates the upper portion of that kind of central vertical axis. I'm not going to anchor this one with a wooden pick because of where it's located. It's not going to fall out. So I have a placement to the top, placement to the bottom and look at the proportions. It's approximately two times, right? It's um, this, uh, the lower one is approximately two times the upper one. So this design will become more dominant in the focal area and then cascading downward. All right, uh, next up, I'm going to make a couple of extra placements onto the sides of the, um, of the uh, cage. But when I do this, I'm going to make these placements so that they are just above those little brackets. So you notice on the cage, there were those little plastic brackets there as part of the basket. By doing that, I'll be able to make sure that that little placement stays put because it's got that additional brace to stay on. Again, a very you know seemingly small but important point uh, that helps you to create a design that won't fall apart. Um, I'm going to go ahead now and add an additional placement or two, and then I'll show you what I've done. So working my way upward, I have a placement here that comes in to the right, and then I'll balance it off to the other side, working my way towards the focal area. When I make a cut on some of this, this is such a beautiful, nice long stem, but I don't need that length. I need some shorter pieces. I could get three nice placements of anise for this design. As a cut foliage, um, it is okay for floral design. It's, it's pretty good. It's certainly not one of the longest lasting evergreens, but it is gorgeous in terms of contrast of color because it's that yellow green. And then of course the fragrance is, is wonderful. Placement here, here, and I'll show you what I've got so far. Okay, so as we work our way upward, you can see a diagonal line through the heart of the arrangement, but the overall geometry is sort of like an asymmetrical diamond. Okay, and from the side view, working from the back forward. Next up, I'm gonna add uh, some additional foliage to this. Um, I think what I'm going to do next is I'm gonna jump over to Aspidistra, which is a fantastic foliage to use in floral design. I cut this in front of our house about maybe, oh Haley, six weeks ago, maybe longer. It lasts a long time in refrigeration. And I have a nice cut flower cooler here at MSU Coastal that I can um, you know, do that sort of thing and, and cut this foliage and have it for a long time. Now I'm going to add this into the design, but I want to show you it's very easy to make these leaves more narrow by taking my knife and kind of slicing off that leaf margin. So now I've got a nice linear leaf to use in the design. And remember what we said before, the order of placement. So floral design best learned in a structured learning environment where you pick up those good habits. Uh, so you don't start off by adding all the fluffy frilly stuff and you know, 
kind of doing this backwards. And the problem with that then is that you end up with a design that looks really lumpish because you're trying to achieve this kind of rounded form and everything is packed together. I have a smaller uh, piece of the Aspidistra. Wonderful plant material. Um, takes it a while to get established. So you wanna make sure if you're into floral design, plant materials like this are some of the first that you should invest in. Particularly if you're growing flowers um, for um, income, you want to get into some of these woody plant materials and some of these that take a longer time. Now this is not a woody plant material, but it does take a longer time to establish in the Southern Garden. And I want to show you another great tip of working with Aspidistra. This is not anything I invented. It's been around for a long time and it's part of the technique of Ikebana, which is Japanese floral arrangement. Take my knife and I cut that petiole, the mid vein uh, of the leaf, and then follow the curve of the leaf. Just take that petiole and pierce it right through the leaf blade like this. Look at that. Could even put like a little piece of shrimp on here for a cocktail party and have a nice little plate. But I could take this now and add it into my floral design, maybe about here. And what it does is it starts to cover up that mechanic in a very artistic way. And I don't have all these big leaves flying everywhere. I want more control over the overall design. So since I put one of those in, I'll put one in on the other side. I find this just maybe a little too broad. So I'll get rid of some of those uh, leaf margins. Nice fresh cut to expose the, the fresh tissue on that stem to make sure it's gonna drink up water. Wow, look at this, y'all. You almost get a little effect of a bow being made. And that's another nice way to, to um, use this technique is to uh, uh, use it like it's a bow. Um, next up, I think I'm gonna pop in some Leland Cypress into the design. And um, you know, if you've got a nice stand of Leland Cypress around your yard and garden, you can come in and do what we refer to as judicious pruning. Judicious pruning. That's what we call it when you cut your neighbor's stuff and you get caught, right? So we always ask for permission. Let your neighbors get to know who you are, um, especially uh, before this time of the year, because it's nice to be able to have access to judicious pruning of uh, evergreens and plant materials that you don't have. I'm gonna follow that same technique that I did before, you know? establishing how long it's going to be, how wide it's going to be, and then fill in from there. Note though, as I make these placements into the fresh flower foam, they are impaled into the foam a minimum of an inch. On a decoration for a wall or door, I really like them to be impaled a couple of inches because again, I don't want anything falling out of place. Many years ago, um, I lived in Columbus, Mississippi, and some of you may know um, uh, Mississippi University for Women, MUW. I lived <clears throat> about three blocks away, a charming neighborhood there. And uh, you know, it doesn't take long uh, once you are in a place and you get to know people in garden clubs, then you get to know everyone in the community. And uh, you know, trying to get a garden established in just a few years is difficult when you want materials like this. And I'll never forget, um, there was uh, a really beautiful, wonderful woman who said, Jim, if you ever want anything from the yard and garden, just come and get it. Just come and get it. And you, know, you appreciate that, but then you kind of wonder like, but what does come and get it mean? I'm, I'm not going to tear down the entire tree, but I might need some really big branches. How does this work? So one day I realized, oh my gosh, I need to get all my plant materials together for a presentation. And I remembered the neighbor over on the next block who, who had said, I have plenty of holly, that, you know, it's here, come and get it. And uh, I thought, let me just go. And there was a branch of it that was spectacular. I mean, loaded with fruit, just glistening. It was like about nine o'clock in the morning, I was gonna do a presentation at about 11, you know, well prepared right, days beforehand, and uh, I got in there and I, I thought, should I or shouldn't I? She said I could, and there's a lot of it here, so I went ahead and I just did it. 
Well, then about maybe 10 minutes after that, I'm loading up my car and I hear this on the window and I see this hand do this and I thought, busted, busted. So I went up and I thought, I'm going to have to, you know, I'll offer to pay. This is, you know, a, kind of a last minute thing. The door opens up and out comes this hand of a remarkable 90 year old woman loaded with cocktail diamonds. And in the middle of her hand was a carved crystal glass filled with a gin and tonic and a napkin. And she said, Merry Christmas. So that's the way we are in horticulture. We all, we all get each other's needs and uh, we go on from there. I'm gonna add some of this little ligustrum. Isn't this pretty? It's a little curly leafed variety. Um, ligustrum is wonderful in floral design because the leaves are naturally glossy. You don't have to use shines, leaf shines or anything like that when you work with plant materials like this. And I'll say for the most part, certainly at the consumer level, um, you really don't need to use leaf shines. The natural waxy cuticle of the plant materials that we have in the South, just wonderful. You don't have to worry about that sort of thing. So again, these placements are being made. Let me show you what I've got going on so far. These placements are being made so that again, you've got this sort of uh, elliptical, um, asymmetric marquee diamond shape. So it's very long on one side, uh, shorter on the other, and filling in with a contrast of textures, a contrast of patterns and a contrast of textures. So this kind of ferny leaf against a broad leaf, and then, of course, then you see these outlines of everything that's pattern. So pattern refers to the silhouette, and texture refers to the sense of touch. So that's a, a, a nice thing to kind of keep in mind as we design with flowers, is that you really need to have a solid understanding of design principles to make everything make sense. Otherwise, you're just flying by the seat of your pants. And we like to apply more theory to what we do in floral design because we teach each other. And it's so much nicer if you're teaching other people as a master gardener, as a master floral designer, to be able to be objective in your language and to say, you know, consider a contrast of texture when you're creating an all foliage design, rather than just saying that looks like it needs something. You see how that doesn't really communicate anything objective to me. And it's so much fun to be able to share the information. All right, little outline going together there, um, but I'm gonna add some little gem to this arrangement. <clears throat> this branch of little gem magnolia um, was growing um, right about this level, and you could tell the orientation of it is such that um, it's looking up at the light this way. And Mother Nature shows you the way to use plant material in design. Um, but I don't really want this big crescent. This design that I'm making is much more formal in, it, in as much as it's formed, right? So I'm going to cut this little piece here. Look at that. Already now, it's cascading into that shape that I'm going to want. I'm gonna get rid of this dude and I'll cut above here and I've got now the nice uh, added section for the lower part of the design. Now this arrangement that you're learning today uses Southern greenery, but uh, it can be adapted to different times of the year using other types of plant materials. All right, so. Got that one popped in at the bottom. Look at this already. Look at what that um, change in texture did to this arrangement. Really coming together. It's doable. It's doable to get lovely professional looking results from the plant materials in your own yard and garden. And I'll tell you something. What we have in our yard, yards and gardens in the South is sought after um, nationwide. Um, <clears throat> many years I was, I was pulling my trash can a little bit closer because this has got some scale insect on it. So I'm not going to vector that around too much more. Um, when I was, before I got into college, I was a professional florist 
in Canton, Ohio, home of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And everyone there loved Colonial Williamsburg style. So evergreens and fruits and berries and this sort of thing. Uh, so, you know, Magnolia doesn't grow in Canton, Ohio. It's really sort of ridiculous that we would, you know, have customers and, and that it would be so, so sought after. Uh, but it's all part of, you know, the marketing that was and is Colonial Williamsburg to make these things look really quite beautiful. It's just suggestion by saying, here it is, isn't it pretty? And then we say, you know what, it kind of is. So we would go to the wholesale florist and try to find magnolia and different types of evergreen that didn't grow in Canton. And, uh, you know, the condition of it a lot of times would not be very good, not be very fresh. And you'd still pay top dollar for it because you knew it would be great, at least for a party or an event. And then I went to Mississippi State for my doctorate and right outside the flower shop on our main campus was a magnolia tree. And I couldn't wait to fill an order with magnolia foliage in it just to have people say like, I don't want that. It grows right here, right? So as I tell my students uh, year after year, decade after decade, you're never a prophet in your own land. You're never a prophet in your own land. You've got to leave and get out in the world to learn something new and bring back that information uh, back home. Okay, so really coming together here. I like the way this looks. It's not done yet. NDY, not done yet. I want to add a focal area to my arrangement and it could be berries, it could be bows, it could be birds. I like to use cones, pine, pine cones for this and keep it really simple, uh, more rustic. But importantly to show folks, you don't have to buy, buy, buy in order to have something beautiful. There are some things you need, good tools, good floral design mechanics, but past that, let the plant materials be the superstar of the, of the process. So speaking of buying, there is uh, another mechanic that I think is really worth your time. And this is called paper covered wire. This is a uh, particular one is Oasis brand bind wire. There are others that you can find on the market, but basically it's just paper covered wire. And the reason why I think it's so good for master gardeners, as well as master floral designers, is the fact that it's wonderful for trellising plant materials. If you want to train something, uh, like I know at home, uh, we, we're trying eucalyptus and it's a, a wispy kind of gangly thing. So a couple of loose bands of this attached to bamboo poles, that paper then does not cut into the bark. Uh, and the same thing is true uh, if you're decorating your banister with evergreens, clusters or garland, this won't cut into the um, won't cut into the stairway into your woodwork. So I'm going to take the paper covered wire and um, <clears throat> wrap it around at about one third of the way down from the stem end of the pine cone. So this is the stem end and this is the pointed end. I'm going to just wrap it through so that the paper covered wire goes through those scales and around back and I'll give it a little twist like this. Next up, I'll bring in um, one of the uh, little wooden picks and I give it a little slack, just a little bit, maybe a half an inch is plenty because when it's placed into the design, the evergreens pop it into place. If you do this too tightly, sometimes the pick then is not quite long enough. And trust me on this one, you need that little bit of slack there. And the proper method for using the wooden pick is to wrap that wire that's attached to the wood pick around the paper covered wire first, then the combination paper covered wire and um, wooden pick all the way down. So darned much fun. So we um, collect our pine cones through the windfalls. We have some beautiful longleaf pine cones here and some loblolly. And when I'm working um, in our high tunnels, uh, growing cut flowers, I'll get the cart and pick them up and throw them into the cart. I don't use any insecticide or sprays with them. Um, I just store them right in the lab with me. And once in a while, a little spider will crawl out. Um, if the spider will work with me rather than against me, I'll put it back outside. Um, 
but uh, you know we don't really worry about stuff like that anymore like we used to. Then I'm going to take, again, just take that paper covered wire, spiral it around that wooden pick. Then I can add the wooden picks fine wire around it. It's not gonna go anywhere. And the nice thing about using the wooden pick that I neglected, Haley, I neglected to, to tell everyone this earlier, and that is the wooden pick is dry. It's dry wood. So when it goes into the fresh flower foam, it imbibes moisture and it helps that wooden pick expand and really hold in place. So it's an old fashioned floral design mechanic, but by the same token, it works. <clears throat> I talk a lot about old fashioned things. I wrote my doctoral dissertation on 19th century floral design, uh, floral design that appealed to consumers, floral design that was going on with retailers, the wholesaling, the crops that were grown then in some of the big cities in um, Europe and the United States. And so much of the work that was being done in 1865 and 1895 is still being done. A lot of the mechanics are the same too, tried and true. So I'm gonna just pop a few of these pine cones into place and then I'll show you what I've done. I'm really getting kind of juiced up to go home and put my Christmas decorations up because of all of this motivation. So y'all are giving me some um, uh, happiness there. Look at that. Oh my gosh. Now, not quite done yet, but almost there. We've got a couple of bucks in the mechanic. Mechanics, I mean, there's not a lot of money in this, but look at the impact that you would have to put a pair of these on the doors of the church for Christmas Eve. Oh my goodness. So beautiful, and it's so easy to do once you try it a few times. So a lot of floral design work um, is really learned through repetition. Um, no one is born with, you know, some people are born with talent for design, but no one is really born with a full out understanding of how these mechanics all work. And a lot of times, if you don't get out there and try some of the different things, um, that are available to us, your work is, is the same all the time. And then it's kind of a little boring. So it's good to have those challenges. I know I like to have challenges in my work. Um, it's a part of uh, university work. And uh, one of the challenges that I'm currently working on is getting my certification in European floral design uh, through, um, uh, through the country of Belgium. Uh, their, their way of designing is somewhat different than ours, and the theory is very different. Uh, and it, you know, it keeps the, it keeps the noggin flowing, right? It keeps that noodle processing. And sometimes you kind of look at it and say, oh, you know, the way we're doing it is okay. But just like you being in Master Gardener, it's fantastic because you're learning the absolute best. Uh, that can be provided to you to carry on and to um, use the new information that's out there. That's off to you. Good place to be. So easy, so easy to do. And another one of these just to kind of cover up that mechanic a little bit. I think I'm ready to start decorating my door back here. So I'm gonna take some of the paper covered wire and I've, um, you know, kind of doubled it over twice. So it's about four. If you, you know, if you need a heavier gauge wire, just make it, right? Just make it. And if you end up ever getting one of these, big tip, only pull the product from the center. See how it's got this band on the outside, a little plastic band. Pull the product from the center. If you try to open this and pull it from out here, you'll wish you'd never been born. It, uh, it uh, will get everywhere and you'll never find what you need to make it work. You'll notice um, as I uh, turn this upside down, you might see a few drips of water. That's one of the reasons why you want to make something like this, you know, a little bit, be a little bit of time before you hang it up. Now I'm in my floral design studio. I don't care if I get some water on the floor, but I will tell you this, when you, um, when you make something like this and it's going to go like in a public place, 
church, business, whatever, you want to make sure that you give that foam a little time to equilibrate, if you will. And that's all there is to it. So we just went over the steps on how to make an evergreen swag. You can do this. I hope that you will take some time to do it on your own. All right, everyone, welcome back. I hope you had a nice little break. I know I did. I had a little, little frosty beverage, non-alcoholic because I'm on the clock, so to speak. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I hope that you learned something new in our early segment um, and were motivated to maybe try your hand at a floral design style that is traditional, yet may not have may not be something you have tried in the past. Remember, we covered a lot of different techniques in that. Talking about the floral design mechanics, the things that hold the plant materials fastened in place within the design so they don't fall out easily. Uh, tips and techniques to increase longevity in your floral arrangement. And just a nice way to enjoy Southern greens. Greenery from the yard, there's nothing like a 100% foliage arrangement. And you know, some people that have never seen them before might think they're boring and they're not. Um, it's a great first level to work in floral design because uh, foliage is not really, uh, not really easily destructed. And, and secondly, um, it lasts such a long time. And then, you know, I find too, as we uh, gain knowledge and ability in floral design, we kind of forget about it. And oftentimes we come back to it. Uh, so it's nice for the seasoned floral designer to take a fresh eye and learn some of the techniques of all the, my goodness, there are hundreds of things you could do with an aspidistra leaf, with palm leaves. And uh, certainly when you combine these into floral arrangements, you have something that surpasses the content of the materials that really become extraordinary. So let's move on now with another design idea. When um, Haley was talking to me about uh, working with you all, uh, she she suggested that maybe, and, and Jeff said the same thing too, maybe y'all would like to see a second design. So um, we put our heads together and we thought it might be, really be nice for you to see a, a table arrangement variation, if you will. So now we see something to decorate the doorway. Uh, now let's maybe bring uh, the holiday indoors or at least work on something that um, sheds a little light on the subject. And that is uh, the um, Christmas evergreen arrangement using a lantern as part of the design. You know, lanterns have been really popular in the decorative arts uh, interior design over the past couple of years, particularly at Christmas, it's a natural, whether you use um, a live candle or if you use battery operated types, which look so wonderful and so real. And the nice part is with those, you can illuminate them and forget about them. You don't have to worry that you have a live candle burning on your front porch or on the dining room table after everyone has left the meal. So these are all really nice things that we didn't have just a few years ago. I think about the wonderful Bevelo lanterns in the French Quarter that you see all throughout New Orleans, but um, you know, walking past the shop in the quarter, um, it, it's just such a warm, uh, warm glow and it's a cozy feeling. So it makes sense to combine the elements of those cozy effects for Christmas time and to make a really pretty uh, floral arrangement. So let's get started with that one. If I can remember what number I need to take the, um, take the camera to, let's see which way it wants to go. There we go. So I'm going to start off with my bin of water. Uh, this arrangement uses a large plastic tray for the for the base. This uh, tray is manufactured and sold mostly for commercial florists, but it's really nothing more than a plate, you know. Um, and I can't tell you over the years as a professional and also for myself and for relatives, how many table centerpieces I've made out of baking dishes. You know, Janice invites you over for Christmas Eve dinner. She said, Jimmy, I don't have anything on the table. So you scour the yard and you get a baking dish and chicken wire, fresh flour foam or tape, and you get a really pretty table centerpiece together. Those are fun things to practice. 
I'm going to use two bricks of fresh flower foam for this uh, application. So these are the standard bricks. Again, you could buy these anywhere through your florist, a wholesale florist. If you have a vendor's license, you can also buy them online. And you use the free float method of hydrating the foam, which takes a minute or less to hydrate that brick. Again, never force that brick down because you're going to have the potential to create that dry core and that's such a bad thing. The other thing that I want to tell you about before is the level of water in this bit in this bin is deeper than the depth of the brick of foam. Now, I don't have a camera overhead to show you this, but I can tell you as this brick is drinking up water, it sinks to the point that it becomes level in the water. So that's another sign that it's fully hydrated. If we were to weigh this brick, 90% or more of the uh, weight of the brick is actually water. So the cellular structure is very similar to that inside uh, plant material stem. <clears throat> Sometimes you'll hear people um, in demonstrations talk about fresh flower foam. Um, lately, um, people have been saying um, they, they want to not use it uh, for different reasons. Um, one of them is that it's a plastic product that degrades, but um, takes a long time to degrade in a landfill. Um, another thing too uh, has to do with chemicals that are leached out of the foam as it soaks. Um, and part of the issue with that really isn't doesn't have much to do on the on the consumer end. It's more retail florists. Retail florists will sometimes have really large bins that will uh, soak like maybe an entire case, like 36 bricks of foam at a time. What they need to do is hydrate those bricks and use them up in a day or so, or move them into containers so that that leachate, that's the water that's left over in the bin, doesn't collect and concentrate those chemicals. Uh, and they also need to sanitize. So, so many times when um, folks get involved in retail floristry, they got involved in it because they have a real knack for uh, uh, design and art. And, one, two, five, one, two, zero. and as such, um, they, uh, and as such, they will, um, you know, time gets away from them and they won't really rinse out that that bin. So that's why it's so good to learn floral design in a structured learning environment where, you know, you work through these um, through these uh, potential problems and go on from there. Now, another thing that you'll hear people say in working with fresh flower foam is you'll have a side that has like maybe holes punched in it. And you have another side. This is more of a generic one. It'll have a logo on the top. The holes are punched in the foam at the manufacturer level. Sometimes folks will talk about the holes that are punched in the bottom of the brick. That is done at the manufacturer level to help to um, hasten the amount of time it takes for water to be taken up into that brick. Now remember, a brick of floral foam hydrates in a minute. So those extra holes punched in it may save an extra 15 seconds. So it's just, it, it does work, but uh, you know, to a retail florist, that might mean something to see it's, it's very quick. But as long as you use the free float method, it really doesn't matter, matter if you have the standard or instant in terms of um, the manufacturer's brand names or trademark names for some of these different techniques that they have. All right. So um, there's that part. Now I've got this really large brick, a uh, uh, double brick of fresh flower foam um, ready to roll. Is my angle good? Can you all see that? And bear with me here as I get these all together. It looks like maybe we're connected to your computer web camera instead of your studio webcam. Yes. Time. Okay. Huh. Well, um, we might uh, we might kind of go in this direction then. I think we can see fine. Right. Mm -hmm. I hate it when I spend fifteen hundred dollars on something and then don't know how to use it. Oh well. Okay. Um, well, the bricks of foam are in the plate, and now I'm going to use um, a couple of other mechanics that I want to tell you about. Um, 
this lantern um, could sit on top of the fresh flower foam, but it's metal and uh, it's just sheet metal and it would rust very quickly. And I don't want to mess. I want to be able to use that uh, it, again if I can. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some shelf lining paper and I really like this one that has the ridges to it because I know that air can get underneath those ridges in case there's moisture. So I use it uh, to line the um, to, to line the uh, drawers here in my floral studio, but I find a lot of times I'll use it to provide um, a layer so that I don't have moisture problems with something like this. Now, uh, or something like this. Now, the little um, uh, block of foam that you saw me use before the cage, it has the smallest little feet to it that will bump it out from the surface of a door or a wall by about maybe a sixteenth of an inch, but it's enough for circulation through there. So I don't worry about it on a front door. and I've never really had a problem with that before um, in working with it. I'm going to just cut a little bit of this shelf liner to fit and then uh, move on from there. Last night I had an opportunity to sit down a little bit. You know, it's nice to take a day off and um, it just feels so weird at extension to take a day off. And you kind of feel like I should be doing something. And, uh, you know, kind of forced myself to take a nap, which was heaven, and uh, looked to see what was on Netflix. And I found a really fun Dolly Parton movie. Great music in it. Little things like that give, get you into the mood, get you into the holiday spirit. I'm going to take um, and, you know, just solidly cover the top of this uh, foam with the plastic. And then I'm going to take the waterproof tape that I used before. Again, sold in floral supply. This is the half inch size. It's um, a cloth base kind of tape. It's very similar to duct tape, uh, but it's green. And then I'm going to make a big X. Yes. Being liberal with the use of the tape, it's inexpensive and you wanna make sure that your mechanics are really secure, very stable. All right. Something like that. Big X. That's really going to hold. Um, don't compromise on the foundation of your arrangement because if you do, if your mechanics are shoddy, if they're loose, um, you're always going to have problems uh, working with them. Okay, so I want to be able to see what this is going to look like as I put it together. And now I've got metal on plastic, which makes me feel very comfortable, and I'll be able to create my floral design to hold together. Bring this down a little bit so you can see. All right, um, a nice selection of evergreen, some things that are the same and some things that are a little different. You know, floral design, we say that we like, especially Southern style floral design, traditional floral design, very cool, very popular style in um, the Southeastern United States, um, more massive, um, very abundant, lots of plant material, um, not necessarily Ikebana, uh, but um, something that's more mass style to line mass with a variety of materials in it. I'm going to start off with some Thuya in the arrangement. So this is, um, again, in the, in the line direction. You might not classify this as a line plant material, but used in the design, it would be. So because I've got such a large lantern, I need to have 
you know, uh, really larger pieces of evergreen foliage. So I can prune it to the correct size, and then I use that screwdriver cut that we learned about before, where it just is sliced on one side, then the other. And when these placements go into the floral foam, they touch the rim of the container. You see how that's hitting the rim of the container, and that stem is driven deeply into the foam, about two inches. Um, you have to remember too, that and, and I forget this oftentimes too when I'm demonstrating, you always want to add a little bit of water to the container. Now the foam will displace water, but it dries out quickly because the water is evaporating from the foam, plus the foliage is starting to drink it up. And the fresher the foliage, the more quickly uh, it's going to drink up water and the greater the amount of water is going to be um, taken up. It's just like a Christmas tree when you first put it in your home. Those first, maybe the first week, it really takes up a lot of uh, water quickly. And then as the tree ages and starts to dry, it takes up less and less because it just doesn't require it anymore. But these first placements go down into the, into the foam um, nice and deep. They touch the rim of the container and they angle downward. So I'm going to make a series of placements on a diagonal within the container. Oftentimes, when we're new to floral designing, we have a tendency to want to bring materials up high into the arrangement. And it's really best to um, uh, not do that, to stay away from that. I want to create an arrangement now that would be suitable for like a kitchen island or maybe um, you have a large table, a large dining room table, uh, like a big farm table or something that looks nice on a fireside hearth. So a, a larger kind of space for your beautiful southern home, as we say, something that fits in with um, our feeling about Christmas traditions. All right, so I have really kind of now I've gone across. Now I'm adding another series, if you will, to this side. So it's an asymmetric triangle. It's, it's low. Nothing is really coming up beyond the little windows of the lantern. So it's nice to be able to keep the prop there for this time so I can see what's going on. Because I want to be able to open this up and add candles to it. Uh, these are going to use live candles. And so those are going to need to be illuminated as we roll through. All right. Some more of the anise. Ooh. And you know, again, just dip in a little water while I'm talking. Mother Nature shows you how to use the plant material. You could tell that this was growing on the shrub like this. So why not use it that way in the design? It's a much more uplifting kind of effect. I just love that. Little things like that. And then it's just really kind of, um, you know, taking these same placements and working my way around to the opposite side of the container. So if I have some anise on this side, I'll add some on this side, or I'll triangulate and make um, a, a triangle, if you will. It doesn't have to be an equilateral triangle of placements. It could be asymmetric, right? Scalene, remember that from geometry? Just showing balance, whether it's going to be symmetrical balance or asymmetrical balance. Coming in a little bit closer there. Um, next up, I've got some Japanese Pittosporum. Wonderful foliage in the dark green. Oh my gosh, again, variety of um, pattern there. And then the glossy texture. This one, of course, is the variegated, um, but quite lovely and really indispensable for floral design because it fills in a pattern so nicely. Look at that, that's such a nice branch. So a little removal there. 
screwdriver cut and then placed into the design to make a nice little bunch of that material. Then as I get closer to the um, closer to the lantern, you see how close it is to the bottom of the container. Don't do this. You can if it's intentional. But what I'm trying to prove is make the design, force yourself to make it low. And then um, as you, you know, gain a little skill, you can always come in sometimes with an asymmetric sweep of maybe like a, a corkscrew willow branch would be beautiful if, if it's painted red or white or snowy. And of course, you, you have to be careful um, that uh, your materials stay far away from the flame. It's important not to light your house on fire during a pandemic in the middle of winter. And don't even ask me about the winter of 1988 when I was in graduate school and that happened to us, because I don't want to talk about it. Look at that. Nice little tight rosette of Japanese pittosporum there. Really covers up that mechanic. It brings the eye back into the design. And you see how I'm kind of doing this in, in sort of like these clusters of three. There are three clusters here and I create um, length with them and then I kind of come in a little bit close. I have some other material here, um, but I'm going to try to, uh, you know, use everything that I have um, and then go from there. A big thing with in designing with flowers is you want to, um, you know, sort of apportion only what you need, cut only what you need and leave the rest. Don't harvest way more than what you need and then have a lot of material that's wasted. Um, and I think that that's especially true um, when, you, when you're when you making purchases. Um, at this time of the year, we don't have enough, we don't have extra time to run to the store to buy another package of, of greenery or flowers. So it's nice to use what you have. And I know also too, teaching online, people will say, you know, I can get more of this in my yard. No, you won't need it. Like the design you saw before, it's very spare at the base. This is a different style of design that doesn't call for an abundance of a fan-shaped arrangement so much as it calls for using very limited amount of materials for maximum impact. If you learn how to design that way, you'll find that you're much more comfortable and confident using a small amount of material and it makes it so much more fun and easy to do. I'm gonna jump over next to some of the little gem. Make a few placements of this. Nice glossy leaf. This one um, is not so healthy, but we'll pretend like it is. And then I'm going to come back in with some of the aspidistra. Now, this is really going to help me to fill in the gaps. <clears throat> if it's a little dirty, a little dusty, it's good to take a paper towel to it uh, to wipe it down. No, no need to, you know, use leaf shines unless you have them at home. The natural glow of the, of the leaf is fine. Look at that. Wow. You'll never look at aspidistra the same way. See that pierced through that way. Very simple technique of just rolling that leaf and piercing it onto itself. So pretty. I can hear a little town of Bethlehem right now. Little variegated leaf of aspidistra now on the other side. Give that stem a nice fresh cut so it takes up water. Wow, easy, easy to do. One of my favorite southern foliages, camellia. Oh my goodness, camellia is a miracle plant. Sasanquas and japonicas in bloom. Do, do you realize what treasures we have? 
that in the northern states right now, they're happy to see a dried thistle by the roadside right now. Brown, brown, and brown. And not only do we have this lush foliage, we have these incredible, incredible flowers. In the 19th century, they were used as event, for event floral design. Women wore them, they carried them, they were used in weddings and parties. And, uh, you know, then at one point they kind of fell out of fashion. And then people said, oh, you can't use them for a corsage or boutonniere because they don't last. Well, any corsage or boutonniere doesn't last anyway. And they make marvelous flowers to wear and carry. Um, I've had a, a couple little photo shoots where we've used camellias in different ways. And I'm sure many of you know uh, my Zell's <coughs> um, uh, growers of the camellias. And it's so nice to be able to see the nursery on their, uh, or share in their open house days. So beautiful, my goodness. Camellias in bloom are an embarrassment of riches. We're so lucky, but we deserve it. A little bit of magnolia on this side. Look at that variety change there now. Oh my goodness. Nice change in texture. I'm gonna do a little pruning there to get this to be more linear. After a while of designing with flowers, you, get, you gain the eye for what goes where. And you know, again, you're never a prophet in your own land. We might be able to, you know, sell something like this in the city, right? In Baton Rouge, in uh, in New Orleans, in the smaller towns, it might be a little bit more difficult. If you're a retailer that's watching this, if you're a retailer and, and watching this, God bless you, because I know you're in the middle of um, a really busy part of your year. Uh, but. Um, again, that idea of if, if it's coming from your own yard and garden, you, you tend not to see the value in it. But for someone who grew up in the South, and to have something like this at Christmas would mean everything to them. And frankly, um, it's, it's designing with plant material like this that makes you feel like, you know, I really would rather have just that, maybe a Christmas tree and just that and be done with everything. So your front door, a live, live arrangement, a live arrangement in the house. And then let's not worry about um, all of the imported material uh, like we used to. Okay, uh, so look at this holly. Um, I don't know what variety it is. That would be a question for my cohort, uh, Dr. Tricia Knight who knows the name of every cultivated variety of uh, holly and camellia and all of those great woody materials at our experiment station. But I'm just gonna come through now and make that screwdriver cut. I could tell you this holly variety is a good uh, thorny one. So that keeps the cat out of it. Oh my goodness, look at what this is gonna do. Three, two, one, and action. Wow. And the holly varieties that we have now, my gosh, um, I harvested one, but I don't have it in this demonstration. I'm going to use it for something else next week. It's like avocado green berries. It's nuts how beautiful it is. And the golden ones, so pretty. So pretty. Nothing like them. Do y'all remember in the old days where a lady wouldn't be caught? With, um, without a corsage on her coat at Christmas time. And today, you know, your grandchildren are the ones who see those kind of fashions and they like to bring them back. And you look at that and think, oh my gosh, I threw mine out 25 years ago. I'm noticing um, in social media, um, some of the interest in um, beautiful place settings. And I think that's really nice. I've worked with some of my garden club friends and master floral designers here at Coastal. And um, one really nice lady um, had created a beautiful table setting of Fostoria glass, plates, stemware, everything was clear glass. And she said it was her wedding present. I guess it was like 50 years ago or more. And uh, it was more than that. And she said, um, I figured I'd go ahead and use it 
j just for this event. And if it breaks, it breaks, because I know when I go, my kids are going to have it on the roadside. And so it's a nice time of the year to come back, reevaluate what we have in our own home collections and use them in a different way. So that being said, when it's time to transport it, it's easily done because it's really just a flat design. <clears throat> and then we can add a little candlelight to this. Do love a live candle. Oh, imagine this in church on Christmas Eve. So for you know, if you don't, if you're on a church decorating committee, you forego some of the other stuff. You know, you don't have to do things the same way every year, unless the celebrant wants it that way, right? That's what we always say in church floral design: the celebrant calls the shots. But um, you can prepare what you want to do ahead of time and say, instead of doing all these Christmas trees and all these things that are getting heavy for us to bear, why don't we just do two lovely arrangements on either side of the altar? with stuff from the yard. Just a thought, you know, don't have to change everything. I was on the church decorating committee myself um, several years ago and just loved it. I love the spirituality of it. And um, in, in um, you know, finishing all of that, um, the, um, we, we, we decided when we were all going to get together and we met in a little bride's room at the church and, uh, um, they called me and they said, can you bring some like crackers and dip to the meeting? I said, okay, like what kind? And, and they said, just whatever you find at the store and be here like at six. I, I arrived in and I got my little grocery bag and they said, red or white? So we had wine and then we kind of just talked and visited for a while. Then we had another glass of wine. And then um, I think we had some more wine and some dip. And then we talked about flowers, but then we had to meet again because nobody remembered what we talked about. But that was okay because um, we all got a lot out of it. I hope you got a lot out of that demonstration about how easy it is. If you got the right things, then you gotta have the right mechanics used in the right way. But we have a wealth of beautiful foliages to use in the South. And Haley uh, mentioned that maybe some uh, questions have come in. Yes, uh, you've received a myriad of compliments on your dialogue and your tips and all of your tips and tricks you've offered them. Um, but we had a few questions come in after the last arrangement. Everyone is more than welcome to send in questions now, um, but we'll start with the ones from the last arrangement. Um, someone anon anonymously asks if you need to add water periodically while making an arrangement in a container. Okay, so, um, you know, if it's a, a containerized arrangement, um, it depends on the mechanics, but like I, how I showed with the lantern arrangement, um, it is good. Once your mechanics are in place and you've got everything taped or otherwise fastened, do go back and add water at that point. But you'll notice too, when you build the arrangement, you want to leave a reservoir. And it's something I didn't mention because there's so many things I left out that you learn, you know, through taking, you know, classes and, and practice. Um, you leave that reservoir so you can always add water to the design. We call it servicing the arrangement. If you jam pack the container full of fresh flower foam, you won't have the space to add the water. The water will run out and, you know, you're putting something like that on your dining room table. You want it to be done right the first time because it's, you know, some work to take it back to the sink and rehydrate everything. OK, um, next question would be, are there any particular floral design supply websites that you would recommend? Um, no, um, but I would say Google it. Um, that's really that's a great question for my master floral designers because they kind of get their heads together and, and they find things. But I can tell you they were they're the ones that um, started me on finding stuff online. All right, next um, someone anonymously from North Carolina says that they have beautiful magnolias there and she wonders about substituting boxwood and the boughs, I guess, of the magnolia 
from a Frasier for greenery? Can they, can she substitute boxwoods? Oh my, for? you know, look at where she lives. You know what I say? Field trip. We need to go visit this wonderful person in North Carolina because, you know, that's like a heartbeat of, you know, uh, evergreen growing and, and flower growing and wonderful connection with Dr. John Dole and North Carolina State University, all the great flower growers over there. My goodness. That aside, oh, yes, boxwood is fabulous. And and um, the only reason why I don't have any in is because um, we don't have any boxwood at Poplarville. And I had to purchase mine and it's not coming in until Monday or I would have had some to use. Love a boxwood Christmas tree. Um, yeah, great foliage for floral design year round. Um, since you mentioned ordering uh, greenery, Cindy asks, where would you suggest purchasing greenery if it's not available in her landscape? Okay, Cindy, yes, great question. You know, I think, um, you know, kind of check in with your flower arranging friends, but um, <clears throat> a lot of times florists and uh, floral departments will have what they call bouquets of a lot of times it's North Carolina greenery. Sometimes it's coming in from Oregon, um, but it's a nice mixture and it's in a little sleeve and you could use that. And, uh, you know, a couple of those will make an arrangement close to this size just to give you an idea of scale. Um, another good source would be garden centers. Uh, whether it is a horticultural garden center or a garden center that's part of a big box store, um, a lot of people will get the trimmings from the Christmas trees when they cut the stem of a Christmas tree for people who are buying them. They'll have a lot of discarded like Fraser fir and other greenery, and a lot of times that's just trashed. So that's a good source. You may have to pick it up you may have to stop by daily though because everybody's kind of catching on to that little tip. And another great tip too is, you know, find the ugliest Christmas tree on the lot and buy it and cut it. Um, especially if you need a lot of greenery, it's one of the best ways to, um, you know, to buy a lot of foliage at one time at a, a low price. Okay. Um... Next, Cindy asks how you might suggest cleaning green greenery, especially bugs that she's gotten from her landscape. One of the best ways to do that is to fill your sink with water and just put the greenery in the sink, in the sink so it's immersed. Um, your, any insects will float up that way, especially if you leave it in, in the sink for an hour. And that's also a good thing to do for the greenery because as long as the cut end of the foliage is immersed in water along with everything else. So putting some weight on it, any insects will float up and that cut end is going to take in moisture. So you know you're arranging with greenery that is fully hydrated. That's all I do. Um, I, you know, if I get a spider or some other insects in the house, I think of it not so much of what's happening at the moment, but how beautiful Christmas is this year or the Christmases of the past and um, kind of let nature be nature. It can be a problem, of course, and not to make light of it, it can be a problem if you're bringing plant material, if you're bringing insects like red spider, uh, not so bad at this time of the year, but aphids can be pretty bad. I know I have a problem with them in my um, floriculture plots right now. I just avoid, avoid them. If that plant material has uh, uh, an infestation, then it's not coming in because I don't want to vector it to my house plants. Uh, someone anonymous, anonymously asks about their half acre of blank landscape and what you would suggest that she plants so she can harvest uh, for Christmas arrangements from her yard and my, how long from that initial planting will she be able to harvest for her? Well, awesome. Okay, so half acre friend, you are in the right place at the right time because you are a friend of Extension, LSU Ag Center, <clears throat> Mississippi State Extension, so on and so forth. Your Extension specialists and agents can help you so much with that. Um, I will tell you this, 
of the materials that I used in my designs, you are able, of course, to plant. But I know that LSU Ag Center and the wonderful uh, faculty have uh, great suggestions for materials that can be cut and used. Typically, you know, the, the pat answer we give on that is it takes about three years. You plant something that's a woody in about three years, you can start to harvest from it. Uh, sometimes longer, depending on the materials. But you're asking the right question now because if you want to plant materials that will be used in floral design that are woody, you concentrate on those first. And then do your zinnias, sunflowers, whatever else that's easy to grow. Think about that later. But, um, you know, look at your whatever sources you would use, whether it's wholesale or retail, depending on your operation, um, and scour those sources. Um, I know that I've done that with uh, some of the clients that I've worked with. We'll just meet at a wholesale nursery and go there. That's with commercial, cut commercial greenery growers. And then as if you're a consumer and you know, you're not going to be reselling this, you just want to use it for beautiful designs for yourself and for your loved ones. Sometimes just going to the garden center and buying nursery stock and sometimes the things that are really inexpensive that you know you can nurse to health, it might take them an extra year to get a foothold, but it's fun to, you know, kind of buy those little pound puppies and watch them grow. Um, you've gotten a couple questions about your courses. So if somebody would like more instruction, how might they sign up for some of your courses? We, um, of course, because of the pandemic, we, I don't have any face to face classes going on right now and I won't for the spring semester, which is basically January to May. Um, I think Lord willing, we're going to be able to get to some face-to-face -face teaching, um, and I look to picking up on that in the fall semester of 2021. However, uh, Master Floral Designer is available as a hybrid online program. Um, in brief, it has three phases. Uh, the online program has three phases. The first phase is a semester online. So video, you, uh, you register and then you, you gain a foothold into our video platform, our learning platform, which is Canvas. Um, and every week, a new series of videos open up for you along with some assignments. There's some little brief quizzes just to make sure that you're gaining the information that you really need in the program. Um, that goes on for a semester. Then phase two is a four day intensive here in Biloxi. I don't take that on the road because there's all this stuff to bring. So it's just easier if you come here and spend um, a week with me. Biloxi is a nice place to stay because um, we have casinos if you like to gamble. And if you don't, we have casinos that have restaurants that are to die for with great seafood. Um, so that goes on for four days. And then the third phase, if you go on for the certificate, is 40 hours of volunteering, very similar to what you do in Master Gardener. So for more information on that, very quick way to give you this would be you go to MSU Cares, M-S-U-C-A-R-E-S, -E and on the MSU Cares website, there's a tab for Lawn and Garden. And underneath lawn and garden, it'll say floral design. And within floral design, you'll see all of my information, my contact information. If you have some extra questions, you can always shoot me an email and I'll be happy to reply. It doesn't look like we've gotten any more questions. Um, we've gotten some favorite quotes from the workshop, which are don't compromise on your foundation and Mother Nature will show you how to use the plant material. So it seems like everybody's gotten some really useful information from you, Jim, and, and we really appreciate your your demonstration today. I certainly enjoyed it and it seems like everybody else has as well. Um, but it doesn't look like we've got any more questions. So I believe that we have brought the Green Stick Workshop to an end today. Thank you. Well, Haley, I hope you have a Merry Christmas and Dr. Jeff, you too, and all of our friends in Louisiana. Merry Christmas.